Yeah. Uh, so Stay bring now. your own community cluster. Let's just see what that's all about. I hope you like my artistic work with the flag there for the old Saltar cross. Okay, so for for the newbies here, are you seeing what is Kubernetes? Has the slide progressed? It has, I can see it has. Okay, so Kubernetes is an open source um, container orchestration system uh, for automating application deployment, scaling, and management. It's really useful when you've got things like um, Docker and uh, you're trying to, uh, to containerize your workloads and you want something to be able to, to manage them. It's more of a cluster mentality. Uh, so rather than having a, sing a single web server hypothetically running on a single container, hypothetically, uh, you would use Kubernetes to deploy a cluster um, of web servers. If one container dies, then Kubernetes will keep an eye on it, and it will um, put another one in there in its place, which is handy. Um, so from an architectural perspective, there's a couple of different major components to Kubernetes. Uh, there's the control plane, which is sort of kind of like the mothership, so to speak. And you've got the actual workers themselves. So if we've got any sort of DevOps enthusiasts out there familiar with things like Jenkins uh, or, or like bamboo build servers, you've got the, you've got the mothership, um, the Jenkins server itself, and then you've got the agents or the workers or the, the bees or whatever the heck they're called. You get the idea. So when you're using um, a managed provider like a, your Amazons or your Azures, um, the, the control plane with all of its many and complex moving parts are managed by the platform. So that's, that's what you pay for. And you pay for that uh, for your usage on like an hourly rate normally. Uh, the actual, that, that's um, pretty much managed by the hosting provider themselves. <coughs> unless you want to actually update your Kubernetes uh, version on the control plane, uh, in which case you've got there the next available version that you can select. So it's certainly not going to be the latest and greatest running on Amazon or Microsoft or whatever. If you want cutting edge, you need to spin up your own, your own clusters. And uh, if you do want to do that, you might want to do a bit of a Google search on one of Kelsey Hightower's uh, repositories on GitHub, I think, and it's called Kubernetes the hard way. That's how you separate the men from the boys. Uh, it's setting up Kubernetes from scratch. If any of you are doing your Kubernetes certified administrator um, exams, or you're looking, you're, you know, you're looking to do that, uh, then you probably want to familiarize yourself with how to build Kubernetes from scratch. It'd be really, really useful. Okay, so on to the next slide. Uh, local or cloud provided uh, or cloud, or cloud provider hosted. Well, we've just talked about um, the option of having it hosted on your Amazons or whatever. Um, you can install it locally. And if you want to, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in running it on your own laptop, you can do that, you know. And so, some of the easier ways uh, to run it locally are listed up on the screen just now. So you've got the likes of, Docker Desktop, uh, when you download and install Docker, uh, Kubernetes, the ability to spin up Kubernetes cluster is not enabled by default. Uh, if you do a little spot of Googling, you'll find out how to do that. It's very easy. You've got a couple of menu clicks, click a button, uh, and it, it will download whatever it is, um, six, eight, 10 little containers, uh, which run under the hood. Uh, to provide you with your Kubernetes cluster that you can interact with locally. So why would you want to do that? You know, wh why would you just not want to use it on Amazon? Well, you can, but there's money involved. Uh, so running it locally on your laptop will allow you the opportunity to be able to spin up your workloads on your own laptop. So if you're developing like an authentication app, an authentication application or a web server application, whatever, um, CI CD pipeline stuff, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you can do it all locally. You know, you don't need to rely on the, um, inter, the interwebs for that sort of stuff. Uh, other options, mini cube, you've probably got your own favorite one as well. You can pop them into the chat window if you've got any recommendations. Vagrant, you know, for the 
you know, for the oldies, the dinosaurs in the room, HashiCorp's Vagrant, wonderful tool. Uh, there's a million different Vagrant files that you can download off the interwebs, uh, install the latest and greatest Vagrant, probably. Uh, it acts as the programmatic interface into Oracle's VirtualBox, as an example. Um, so you run, the, you run Vagrant up, it reads a file called Vagrant file with all the information required to create the Kubernetes cluster. It then speaks to Oracle's VirtualBox and it will create the infrastructure that you need. It's normally pretty straightforward, but really, really pay attention to what Vagrant versions work with what VirtualBox versions. Really, really important, very sensitive, okay? Um, from our hosting option, we've talked about Amazon's Elastic Kubernetes Service, EKS, Microsoft's Azure Kubernetes Service, Google, GKE, the, you know, the list goes on. There's plenty available there. Uh, just be, be aware that um, once you create your Kubernetes cluster and you start to deploy a couple of little test bits on there, the clock is going to be running with your credit card. So just be, be aware of what the costs are. And especially when you come to choosing the compute power that's available for the workers. So the actual compute that does the actual uh, the hosting of the containers, because that can get that can get very expensive. Keep an eye on it. OK, uh, moving on. So the code that I'm going to show you, it's from our repository, uh, which I picked out a little while back. And it was written uh, using Terraform, a Terraform version syntax prior to Terraform 0.12. I think it was 0 0.11 uh, was the version of the syntax. Uh, if that's not been up, if it's been updated, that's awesome. And I'm really sorry that I didn't have a chance to double check today. If it's been updated, like in the last month or two, it will probably work straight out of the box. Otherwise, you may need to tweak the code uh, by following the URL here. Um, the, the upgrade from before Terraform 0 0.12 to version 1.2 and beyond. It's a major upgrade. The, syn the syntax changes. There are little cheats that you can do, though, uh, on the command line. If you download version 0 0.12 or whatever the latest one is, you can actually run Terraform <coughs> on the last line there on the slide. You can run Terraform 0 0.12 checklist, and it will actually scan all your code. Um, and it, it will actually correct it for you. It, it will give it its best shot at correcting it. Make sure that you've got your code checked into source control beforehand so you can do like a git diff uh, to understand where the differences are. Hopefully, you'll have to go through none of that, but it's it's really not brain surgery, so give it a try. OK, next slide. Um, let's talk about the repository that, uh, I, that I have been using just to try and simplify you creating your first cluster. So I've put a little cheat up the top there, and it says Google, Terraform, AWS, EKS. Uh, and the very, very top of the list, you'll find the repository that's on the second line there. So once you've actually cloned down the repository, we're going to be changing into the directory structure that I've indicated on the slide. Um, this is where you probably want to um, update the variables file. So variables.terraform or .tf. Uh, this is where you can do things like uh, tell it what region you're in. So from an Amazon perspective, um, I would probably want to change my, my region from the default uh, US West 1 or US East or where, wherever the person was to um, AP Southeast 2. That's, you know, that's obviously for... Uh, Sydney and Australia. Uh, your, your mileage may vary on that one. So you just want to update uh, in there just uh, any other little variables that you want to tweak. Uh, I didn't have to tweak anything from memory at all. Uh, so check it out. Uh, it's possible to update what size of compute you want for your workers in there as well. 
So by, by default, I think it creates uh, one, one like T2 small or something like that, and one T2 extra large. So you've got, or two T2 extra large. So it creates three workers by default, uh, all in an auto, uh, an auto scaling group as well, which is nice. And um, yeah, you can tune the compute power that you want. You can actually run uh, various uh, container workloads by using labels such that they, a particular workload will actually run on a particular size of compute as well. But that's maybe a little bit more advanced than this talk. OK, so just working down this slide, uh, there's the, the main.tf file will be in there as well. Uh, in there, there's a, there's a cluster name variable. You, you, can, you can change the actual prefix you want to be anything, anything you like. Uh, I've changed the cluster name prefix here to be K8S, as in Kubernetes. It took me a while to work that out, K8S, because Kubernetes has like 10 letters, I think, and there's K, and then there's eight letters, and then there's an S at the end. Just for the noobs, now you know. So K8S rocks dash EKS, and I left the rest as is. So you, you don't need to do that at all. So second last line, uh, then we do um, Terraform init. OK, so this is assuming, obviously, that you've installed Terraform, which is a single binary that you download uh, from HashiCorp, uh, awesome company, produce some great tools. And you put it in your path somewhere. So you run Terraform init. So what does that do? It has a look at it, um, has a look through your code to find out what, what modules it needs to pull down to be able to make it work. So we're going to be creating some AWS um, instances, for example. Uh, AWS Compute, uh, so it needs to download the AWS module uh, to, such that it, it will then be able to execute the commands in behind the scenes to be able to talk to Amazon, to be able to create the cluster, to be able to create the workers. So we do ter Terraform init. That's oh, only one off. Uh, that will then pull down the latest or the required modules at the required versions. If there's any version locking going on in your code, it will just bring down that version. If there's no locking, it will bring down the latest version. So the next time you run it, it may pull down an updated version. Uh, you just need to be aware of that. Normally, you, you don't need to run the Terraform in it for us for a second time, unless there is a specific problem that you're trying to address. Uh, then we run Terraform plan. Now, Terraform plan is like a dry run. So it will tell you what it would have done without actually modifying any, um, any of your um, configuration. So it will, it will look at uh, any time Terraform runs and it, it manages or creates cloud resources, uh, it dumps a note of them into uh, our state file. So it's a manifest of what it knows that it's managing up in the interwebs. So when you run Terraform plan, what it's doing is it's comparing what, what's in that state file what, what you actually want to do uh, versus what, what you actually have up in the cloud vi via that state file. And it will tell you about any differences. Uh, and it will, if there are 100 things that, you're, that your code requires to be managed up in Amazon, but you've already got 60 of them that have been created already, then it'll only create four. It doesn't, it doesn't recreate everything. So. What we do, just because we're being paranoid, we do a Terraform plan minus out, and then we dump everything it, it would, it's going to do gets dumped into that out.tf state file. It's just, it's a little binary file, which at that point in time that we ran Terraform plan, this is specifically what, you know, what we needed to do. So we've got full control. And we can say with a, a much higher degree of certainty exactly what we are changing. So we run Terraform plan min minus out. It creates the out file. <coughs> and then we apply that out file. So we do Terraform apply and point it to the binary file that's got all the information 
of the resources that we want to manage. You don't need to do the minus out into the out file. It's just better practice if you do. There's nothing stopping you just doing Terraform plan if you want to see what's, what's going to change and make sure it looks about right. Uh, you don't need to do that. And you can just do Terraform apply. <clears throat> and it will say, I've checked the state file. I've checked what, what you want to manage. Uh, and you know I'll just get on with it. Do you want me to create the, these 52 resources? And you go, yep. And it'll go ahead and do it. Uh, so since we're creating a Kubernetes cluster, it's a good point to put the kettle on at that point or pop down to the beer fridge where Rob is. You can see him there. You can give us a wave, Rob, by the beer fridge. <laughs> yeah, so put the kettle on because creating a Kubernetes cluster can take about 10, 10 or 12 minutes, something like that. Um, okay, so moving on. What do, we, what do we end up with at the end of all that? Well, we end up with the control plane or the control plane configured. So we've actually got a cluster that's going to be running up on the control plane in Amazon. Uh, we've also got some um, automatically scaling workers that are being created. Um, and, we, and we can override the compute, the worker compute if we want. Another thing that we end up with is an authentication file or a file containing all the certificate and authentication details uh, for Kubernetes to be able to uh, communicate with the um, API that sits in front of the control plane. So that's going to be a really, really, really uh, useful thing for us to know about. It's the equivalent of having like an SSH private key to be able to connect on to uh, the uh, and manage the the resources in the in the Kubernetes cluster itself. So then, if if we get all all that stuff right, then we should be able to run the command at the bottom there, which is AWS EKS list clusters. That bit has to work first. So what does that have to do with uh, with Kubernetes and EKS? The answer is um, absolutely nothing from an authentication perspective. That is AWS credentials that need to be correct, first of all, to be able to make that happen. So you need to get that bit working, first of all, um, before you go on to any of the Kubernetes authentication stuff, which we're going to cover in a second. So make sure you can do AWS EC2 describe instances or something like that. Uh, that, that will then show that your authentication to be able to get on to um, AWS is working fundamentally. Uh, okay, and if there's any permissions related issues, if you do A AWS EKS list clusters, uh, you should be able to uh, validate that you've got sufficient authorization to be able to use the Kubernetes stuff as well via an Amazon role, an uh, IAM role, <clears throat> which we're not going to cover here. OK, on to the next slide. OK, so we're going to do a bit of a, bit of a demo thing, because um, I've been doing my demo gods dance thing to try and make sure that all that stuff works. And Scott has promised me that uh, it's all going to go flawlessly. When I was crying earlier, I was so nervous. And Rob said, don't worry, it'll all be fine. So they've said it's fine, so I'm sure we're going to be good. Uh, OK. <laughs> sure, it's not that nervous. Cheers. Ribena, probably. OK, so we talked about making sure that the AWS credentials are, are all set up correctly, first of all. And then I said that Terraform create a, creates a file which contains all the certificate information to allow you to authenticate onto the Kubernetes cluster. So. Um, let's just have a look at the slide just for just for a, just another minute. So, the way that the authentication um, certificates and configuration to allow you to be able to communicate with the Kubernetes cluster can typically be found in your own home directory. Uh, .cube is the subdirectory that typically gets created, and then there's a file called config. So that's got all of your authentication stuff. As I say, it's the equivalent of like your SSH private key 
pl uh, it's it's got information about the Kubernetes cluster endpoint. So there's an Amazon address that will be in there. I'll show you a little example just in two secs. The good news is, as I say, that the Terraform job, when you run it, the Terraform apply, it actually creates a cube config file for you. <clears throat> so um, how do we actually manage the Kubernetes cluster? Well, there's, there's a number of different ways of doing it. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is a cube CTL or, or cube control. So you download that as a, it's a single binary again, which is nice. Uh, just put it in some sort of executable path. And uh, then we can run cube, cube control cluster info. Okay, so that's, a, whoops, that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So we've created the, the Kubernetes cluster. I'm going to stop screen sharing on that screen. Uh, what we got? There we go. Can we, is that readable or do you want me to end big in it? How about just end big in it anyway? Okay, so if I was to do like a, <laughs> so I do, uh, if I can say it, what was it, can, um, sure. AWS, EKS, what was it, list, list clusters or something? I can't remember. Where are we? Uh, list clusters, yep, exactly. So list clusters. Oh, yep. If it if it's a really hard one, There's you can just answer question it. Question that's come in. Uh, <laughs> is there any reason that you've I used use whatever comes out of the box of token unless I'm told a good reason to change it? Hope that answers it. I'm all for making life easy. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I would probably... There, I, I'm a bit... Yep. For my yep. own purposes, I tend to use tokens because it's a bit easier. Yep. Um, what this does... Production-like clusters. Yep. Um, people generally... What this is actually use doing under the hood, right? we are going to get to, on the next slide, we're going to talk about an, another little utility, uh, which I didn't actually break before this demo to show why it's there. But what it does is it actually handles, it, it, it is token, actually, because I'm. It, it is token. It is token. Um, it's using the uh, AWS IAM Authenticator under, under the hood, which we're going to uh, see in the next slide. And what that does is it does the AWS STS commands. So that's the token service, right? Simple token service <clears throat> to generate the, the required te temporary tokens uh, to be able to communicate. So I do apologize. Okay, so we've done a bit of an AWS EKS list clusters. So what fundamentally does that show us? That shows us that we that the AWS credentials are looking okay, and I've probably got the right authorization to be able to at least talk to the, the Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so it's all looking good. So let's do a quick uh, Q cube cuttle <laughs> and a bit of a sort of cluster in cluster. There we go. Very close. Oh, hang on a second. Right. So can't can't connect on to Kubernetes Docker internal something or other. Okay. So I've forgotten to do one bit, of course. It does not know how how to uh, wh where my where my cluster endpoint is nor how to do the authentication sort of stuff. So I mentioned where that file came from. It gets generated automatically by the Terraform job. So we can see here, there is a file called kubectl underscore mbn stuff. If I buy that, there we go. If anybody's got a good memory, there you go. You can memorize that certificate. But it's got the, um, the server endpoint in there. So if I was to take this, just bit, this is if you're just newbies and you don't care, then what you can do is you can just take take this cube control file and just copy it straight over the top. If you only care about this cluster that you're just creating, uh, I can't talk and type at the same time. So 
I'll get dangerous here. So I'm just going to copy the configuration file that Terraform created over the top of my home directory .cube config file. You could append it if you wanted, if you've got multiple clusters. So if you're running local Docker, Docker desktop cluster, and also uh, a, an, an AWS cluster. I, I only care about this one cluster, so I'm just going to go straight over the top of it. There we go, which means that when I run this command, kubectl, uh, cluster info, it's going to have a look at that file, the .cube config file. It's going to know where the cluster endpoint is up in the interwebs on Amazon. <clears throat> and it's going to then try to authenticate, uh, which I'm really hoping it's going to be able to do. Any second now would just be fine and dandy. Yeah. Time for an intermission, Scott. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> Hey, sorry, that was it. No, sorry. I ran, you weren't, you um, weren't fast enough. Another poll. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry, Scott, I, I interrupted you. Did you have a slot just to fill in there, or do you want to carry on? Well, yeah. I think I might run one, if yep. that's okay, just which Kubernetes distribution people are using, because um, this is one that I really, really like to find. And for anyone that says other, just pop it in the chat. Because, um, I mean, I, we've sort of put a list of a bunch of big ones and, you know, some of the Debian ones are missing and, and so on. I just want to, oh, there's a Rancher fan. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so whoever answers other, just pop it in the chat because I, I find this absolutely fascinating. Um, the last time I checked, because there's an official list on the Cloud Native Computing Foundation website of Kubernetes distributions. And there were about 170 the last time I checked, but that was quite some time ago. So I don't know if that number has grown or has um, reduced since then, but there's there's a heap of them, right? We've got a couple. Yes. Crops and Kiotis Rancher and got, um, Kubernetes native. Ash yeah. is also Ooh. giving us a bit of a bit of a tip there with regards to an export capital cube config equals and then your path. So if you wanted, let me show you what that looks like. So it'd be like you know export uh, cube config equals that. So you, you could export that rather than actually dumping over the top of your dot cube slash config file. Thanks, Ash. That's a, a much more tidier way of doing it. Do what he says, not what I say. <laughs> Are we all good, Scott? Awesome. Go for it, man. So we've only got about another three more hours of this talk before we really get into it. So I might as well just sit sit back and get comfy. Only kidding. Okay, so we, we've done our cube, cube control, sorry, cube cuttle, cluster, in, cluster info. And it shows us that we've got a Kubernetes master. So we've actually got an API endpoint. Uh, so this is looking good. So, okay. So um, if I had not installed the, oops, the aforementioned, sorry, AWS IAM Authenticator, uh, which AWS IAM Authenticator, something like that. There we go. Uh, Homebrew will install it for you quite nicely. What that does, that's the thing that I was just mentioning that does all the um, AWS STS commands um, under the hood to generate the required uh, tokens, te temporary tokens. So if you had, <coughs> if if you were just installing this stuff from scratch, that that kubectl cluster info would have failed, and it would have provided you with the error message there, unable to connect, getting credentials, AWS IAM Authenticator not found in path. That's only one way by which you can do. The tokens, uh, there's another couple of ways from memory. Um, 
you'll need to Google that one. I've only ever used this one. So there we go. We can just download it and install it. Homebrew works, uh, so it makes it nice and easy. Then we go back and test again and rejoice. The Kubernetes master was up and running. Um, it's always authentication and authorization that kills fun, as we all know. So I think we've just about got over those issues. So now we've got a working cluster, which is awesome. So once we've finished uh, rejoicing, we can go on to the next slide. And we've got our cheeky, but not pretentious, little sample deployment. So Kubernetes has got this um, our concept of, of what's known as uh, pods. So from a newbie perspective, you could be forgiven for um, interchanging pods and containers, although pods are actually um, units that you can run one or more than one pods, uh, sorry, one or more than one container in, if you like. But as a newbie, think of them sort of um, interchangeably, and probably no animals will die as a result. So we've got pods, which are like your Nginx. Have we got any, any, any Nginx fans on the line? Scott, anybody? Or? <laughs> Scott may or may not yes. work for F5. So he's got slightly biased when it comes to that sort of stuff. <laughs> oh, plus, we have to actually sort of admit, yep, and HA Indeed. proxy with you, Alexander. <laughs> Very nice. OK, so uh, Kubernetes um, input files are, are just straightforward YAML. So t text, readable, uh, even somebody with a very low IQ such as myself can sort of kind of pick up how it hangs together. So that deployment.yaml, it, it's quite an advanced little, little ditty. Uh, what's it doing? It's creating <clears throat> something that's got metadata name of Nginx deployment. So that's just a label that you know that we've given it. Under the spec section, we've got an app called Nginx replicas. That means that we're going to, you know, we're going to deploy X number of pods running this Nginx magic. So there's two of them there, two replica sets. Uh, and we're going to deploy it down the third last line. We're going to deploy a specific version. So you can upgrade just by changing the uh, changing the version in here and then re redeploying and Kubernetes will figure it out for you. And also any ports that you want to expose. We've got container port um, 80 down there. So um, oh, yes, thank you, Robert. <laughs> Somebody's just reminded me that uh, you're still looking at my terminal screen. I knew that really. Seriously, I did. Uh, you're probably, when you see these boring slides are put together, you maybe want to go back to the terminal screen. Okay. So we've got sample deployment Sorry, that I was just talking please. to there. <laughs> and you were trying to imagine what it might look like in your head. Anyway, uh, let's do a little example of a deployment, shall we? And I will put back to my terminal screen just in one second. So history, uh, cube thingy. Right, that's the one. Let me just whip back onto my terminal screen. You guys and gals should definitely put your hands up to do one of these talks, by the way. They're lots of fun. Hardly stressful at all. <laughs> so the really good thing when you do volunteer to speak is everyone's got really interesting things to say, I think. Um, and it doesn't matter on what your level of experience is. So one of the best talks that I've ever seen at a meetup ever um, was at an Ansible meetup where one of the guys um, who was quite new to Ansible got up and and talked about his journey of learning, learning Ansible and the technology, right? So just how he approached it, what he learned. And it was, it was very, very it was really good because there were a lot of people that came up to him after he spoke and said, yeah, yeah. I have done the exact same thing. So don't think that because you don't have a super technical, awesome yeah. talk with a demo that you can't get and up who, and do a talk. And who cares? Like, if it doesn't work, can. really, really, who cares? At the end of the day, all you're doing 
is you're just sharing a story, you know, with people. Uh, and hopefully, you know, like if I've got a few scars down my arm, I might be able to give you a few tips on how to avoid them. Um, yeah, like if anybody's interested in learning how to do these talks better, have a chat with uh, the boys from sort of NBN. But um, we'd be happy to put on like a bit of a session or whatever just to try and help you, you know, to prepare. But you're in really, really good hands up in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, have a chat with those guys first. Okay, so kube cuttle apply. There's a specific YAML file you can put in a URL if you want, or a local YAML file which you want to hack yourself. So there we go. Doing its magic, pulling down that YAML file, pulling down some um, Nginx um, containers, images, and talking to Amazon at the same time and taking a lot longer than it normally does. This is normally really snappy. Never mind, I'm sure it's gonna come back. Unable to connect, awesome. So is that my bandwidth or, let's try once more. I should have downloaded that deployment.yaml file. See, an experienced speaker. I should have downloaded that deployment.yaml file onto my local machine. How badly prepared is that? Maybe the website's down or something. Don't anybody dare check because that's my story, okay? <laughs> right, so you've all got, that's fine, Slack was down, AWS Summit. Ah, AWS Summit, AWS. It's their fault. They're stealing all the bits and bytes out on the interwebs. Anyway, this is exactly why it's important to keep smiling when things uh, fall on their back and your legs sort of start kicking in the air. So what we do there, we just go ahead. Once it's done its deployment thing, when Amazon give us a few bits and bytes, uh, we do like a cube, a cube control, and we do, um, you know, we can show we can show the pods that are running, uh, we can show the services that are there, the deployments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was that was wonderful, right up until the point that it wasn't. So there we go. Uh, I'm just going to switch back onto my death by PowerPoint slides, uh, which may very well be the final one, which means I'll be handing over to somebody that actually knows what he's talking about, being Pratik after this. Not that we're laughing was that, at you. Not that you're laughing at me, but what? Ha ha ha. Nice. But, but I did give you. I didn't giggle. check that my flies were up before <laughs> I went on camera. <laughs> okay, cube, cube control, describe deployment, Nginx deployment, and it'll show you some stuff. There's a few little, little cheat sheets up there uh, on what you would expect to see and where we did our cube control apply. Oops. Come on, it's not that difficult. Whoops, very bottom there, cube control apply. Uh, the particular file you can do cube control uh, delete and it will go ahead and it deletes all the resources and you'll be back where you were before. Uh, so next question, how to actually, now we've created um, a cluster of um, Nginx web servers there. How, how do we actually access them? Or you think you just point maybe at the Kubernetes uh, API endpoint on port 80 or whatever, and it's all magically going to work. It's a little bit more complex than that because you need to be able to essentially tunnel in through the Kubernetes um, API. Um, so we need to talk about things called um, ingress controllers. Uh, that's definitely another talk. Uh, but we, at the end of all this, we have got a Kubernetes cluster up and running, and we so damn nearly be able to actually deploy something on it. We got that close. Anyway, maybe um, ingress controllers might be one of the talks that we want to do next time, if anybody's interested. But um, other than that, thank you very much. If anybody's got any questions or whatever, um, please do fire away. Or all go really quiet, that's fine. So there's... There's a question in the chat um, just asking, and I think it's about the previous slide, or maybe just asking if there's a 
Uh, debug or debug device yes. mode when you're running um, the cuddle command. Somebody yeah. on chat is is going to tell me you um, export a particular variable from memory. Uh, there's cube there's cube control logs. So cube cube control logs deployment and it will show you all of the deployment jobs that are happening. It's been I haven't typed the commands for a few weeks now, uh, but it's it's really pretty easy. Like if you do cube cube control or cube cuddle. Uh, on the on the command line and hit and hit return, the help commands are pretty damn good. Like they're pretty easy. Uh, I've I've never really sort of struggled too much in that field. It's not like immensely obvious all the time that cube control logs um, is going to be your friend in there. Sorry, say again. Scott? It tells you most things that you want to know, right? Yeah. It hasn't told me it how, tells to, you most things how to that cure you would my know. sourdough starter that's been going for a while now, but maybe I'm missing a patch or something. I don't know. <laughs> I suspect so, man. Yeah. Oh, hang on. I was going to say, we've got like one slide after as well where I was talking about building a local cluster, but I think we talked about that one briefly just at the beginning there. I'm happy to share this deck. If anybody wants to tor torture themselves with it, we can certainly um, email that out after. We, Scott, we have the capabilities to do that, don't we? We do. So I have recorded the session, and we will also be placing a link to the slides somewhere as well.